Greetings YouTube. Today we're going to compare Trevor Jacobs' plane crash to David Lush's plane crash, which happened in Half Moon Bay in 2019. There's some striking similarities between these two incidences that we're going to get into in a lot more detail. And we're going to focus quite a bit on uh, the David Lush plane crash specifically. This is a video of the crash footage from the David Lush plane crash. This video was taken by David himself with his cell phone camera. It was also taken from a friend who was flying with him that day who filmed him crashing his plane into the ocean from his airplane, which was a Cessna. Really, really interesting. Uh, David has a history of publicity stunts. He's a uh, former uh, snow sport athlete, similar to Trevor Jacob, and he now owns a outdoor clothing company that sells ski gear. So there's a shot of him kind of gliding the plane into the water in August of 2019, and this location, according to the NTSB report, which we will get into soon, uh, is about six miles from uh, a nice open field landing area on uh, land just north of Tinnitus Creek, California. David Lush is no stranger to controversy, and just in January he was fined and sentenced to, uh, his fine was $10,000 community service, 160 hours for riding a snowmobile uh, in a prohibited area within White River National Forest. There's a shot of that on his Instagram page right there. He also took fake photos of himself uh, pooping in a mountain lake in the same region. Uh, he says he's going to appeal this decision. There's a link to the court papers in the description below if you want to look at those in more detail. Now that we've covered some more relevant background information on who David Lesh is and where his crash was, I want to look at a clip of him being interviewed about the crash. And then we're going to talk about how it compares to Trevor Jacobs' statements he made to the New York Times about his crash. Uh, before we get into that interview, the one thing I'll say is my gut tells me David's a much better con man. He's has a lot more experience um, confidently lying through his teeth. That's my opinion. Take a look at this clip and let me know what you think of about its level of authenticity in the comments below. Yeah, I definitely have a daredevil, uh, you know, uh, image, absolutely. Most of that is a lot more um, calculated uh, than people realize, I think. Hmm. Um, what, what kind of a stuck, out, uh, stuck out for us is that the footage of you on the wing of the plane, um, who has the presence of mind to shoot a selfie when you're standing on the wing of a plane? I mean, I do. I have the presence of mind. Um, I have the presence of mind to not kill myself in putting it into the ocean. Um, I have the presence of mind to grab uh, everything out of the airplane that can help us in that situation, including my cell phone. Um, and I have the presence of mind to record um, that and every other aspect of my life. I put, you know, basically everything I do on on Instagram and Facebook. Um, we make, you know, these videos. Um, so yes, I, I have the presence of mind to do that. Uh, the composition of the shots, I mean, you, you must do this instinctually. Yeah, I, I've been shooting video since I was in like seventh grade. I bought a video camera in middle school, um, you know, high eight video camera. I've been making videos my whole life. Yeah, because um, most uh, survivor videos that we see, they're shaky and yeah. they're just poorly composed. Once, once I started getting hypothermic, I was shaking pretty good. Um, and it was, the video got significantly worse and I was having trouble keeping, keeping the, the camera steady. Um, but until the hypothermia set in, yeah, I was, you know, you're floating around there for 45 minutes, I'm gonna get some shots. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a couple things I wanna talk about from that clip before we get into the NTSB preliminary investigation report from his crash. First, he reported that the 
reason for the crash was engine failure due to the lack of fuel being able to flow through the fuel lines because they were clogged with sediment. Second, David's primary response when asked if he crashed his airplane on purpose for social media views and as a publicity stunt is that he would not do that because he loved his airplane and he had it insured for less than its value so he was underinsured and would lose money by doing such a thing. This contrasts sharply with the Trevor Jacob plane crash. Trevor Jacob's airplane was not insured according to the reports we've seen so far. My take on that is that they're both publicity stunts and that David's a better con artist and wanted to get some insurance money out of the deal. Alrighty, let's get into this preliminary NTSB report from the David Lush plane crash. Now, it's been over two years since this plane went down and the NTSB has moved very slowly on getting this report to completion. If this is an indicator of how slow Trevor's report will take to get to completion, it may be that Trevor's flying airplanes for the next three years until he gets in front of a NTSB judge and they decide whether or not they're gonna take his ticket. As controversial as David is, it looks like he's still flying. He's still got a pilot's license because this investigation is still in process two years, over two years after the incident. One other way to look at this is that this investigation has been in process and ongoing for 30 months. So if they finish it in six months, it will have taken three years to get to completion. Looking at the NTSB report, paragraph three on page one talks about the pre-flight inspection the morning of the accident. I'm going to read a couple sentences from that. The morning of the accident, the pilot performed a pre-flight inspection of the airplane. During the pre-flight, he recalled sumping both the left and right fuel tanks. Could not remember if he used the sump in the nose. He had to sump each tank four to five times before the fuel was clear flaky, from flaky black sediment. He thought this was more debris than usual, than usual, but was not alarmed because he was finally able to sump clean fuel. I wonder if this was the genuine root cause of the engine stopping running on this aircraft, which led to the crash, or if David purposefully put sediment in those fuel tanks to clog up any fuel filter and stop the engine from running so that he could make it look like this plane crashed really well. Now, it's at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, so, and it's been there for 30 months, almost three years. There's no realistic way we could get an answer to that, so it may just be a hypothesis that stays a hypothesis. All right, I'm going to read the next paragraph of the report and then break it down a little further. The pilot took off and landed at RHV to pick up a passenger and departed at about 1125, landing at Monterey Regional Airport, Monterey, California, about 1200. During the departure from RHV, the pilot observed the fuel flow gauge showing an unstable flow oscillation, oscillating and decreasing from 16 to 11 gallons per hour. He switched the fuel boost to low, which appeared to, allevi to alleviate the problem. The pilot departed Monterey about 1550, landing at 1600 on the turf runway at Monterey Academy Airport, Watsonville, California. He departed at 1630, landing at RHV to drop off one of his passengers. That passenger, who was also a pilot, was planning to fly a Cessna 182 
in tandem with the accident airplane with the purpose of them taking pictures of each other. That last par sentence in that paragraph is basically like the NTSB, in my opinion, saying these two guys were flying together in the same airplane. They each got into their own airplane so that the guy in the Cessna could film the guy in the other airplane crashing his airplane. Every good pilot knows that when you're flying an airplane, it's your job to fly the plane. No good pilot goes flying with a cell phone camera in their hand just so they can film their buddy out the window. So I definitely look at that last sentence as evidence of an intentional crash. Let's break down this next part. Accident pilots stated that he was making a descending left turn at about 3,000 feet MSL. The engine became quieter and stopped producing power. The JPI engine monitor display 700 indicated the exhaust temperature EGTs were declining to zero and the fuel flow was zero gallons per hour. He switched the boost pump to low for several seconds and then high and then switched it back off. He manipulated the throttle, propeller, and mixture controls full forward and about 500 feet AGL. He positioned the fuel selector from the left to the right tank. The engine revved up momentarily and quit again. He stated that the propeller was windmilling and the engine was not producing power, which he described as the momentum of the turning propeller was causing the engine cylinders to keep moving but not producing power. He stated there were no unusual vibrations, sounds, or odors. So as the plane glided from 3,000 feet to 5,000 feet, David tried to get the engine to turn back on. He was six miles from a flat landing area. We'll look at this in Google Earth in a little bit. So just keep that in mind. Instead, based on what we're reading in the port report, it looks like he put all his focus and energy on getting the engine to turn back on and getting that clogged fuel to flow. Next paragraph. The pilot further stated that he communicated with the pilot of the Cessna about the engine failure, and he opted to ditch with the landing gear and flaps in the retracted position. He continued, he configured the airplane into a level altitude about 10 feet above the water surface and waited for it to settle onto the water. Immediately after impact, he and the passenger egressed the airplane with several items they wanted to salvage from the cockpit and stood on the wing until the airplane sank an estimated 40 to 50 seconds. Just prior to the anomaly, the passenger took two cell phone videos, both of which were posted on social media platform Instagram. The last video started at 1735-36 at, at location three nautical miles north of the accident site and captured 16 seconds showing the pilot making the left turn just prior to the engine losing power. Reference picture 01. So this paragraph reads like a pilot that wants to glide this plane down with the landing gear up right on the flat surface of the ocean and not leave that landing gear down and glide into an open field six miles away. Looking at the cockpit instruments prior to engine failure, everything looks as it should. That said, I'm a very amateur aviator. I'm much more of an internet investigator. So if you see any red flags in this picture number two, please put those in the comments below. 
because I want to learn more about how to better understand this data. It looks to me like everything was working fine and then it stopped working when the fuel stopped flowing because the fuel lines were clogged with sediment though. Looking at the second to last paragraph of page five of the report, the last sentence states the following. The depth of the water is about 145 feet and the airplane wreckage is not expected to be recovered. That is something we can check. We can look at the coordinates for the crash and look at the water depth on an ocean chart and see if the depth is accurate based on this preliminary report. So we've copied and pasted the latitude and longitude in decimal degrees into Gaia GPS. And these coordinates, of course, are the plane crash location from David's crash that was in the NTSB report. And a quick measurement shows that he's about 6.7 miles from land or offshore in this layer. Let's go ahead and load our BFR later and take a look at that just so we can get a lay of the land from a pilot's perspective. And we can really see that this airplane whose engine failed 3,000 feet above the water was very, very close to being on shore. I'm not sure what the glide ratio is on this particular aircraft, but I would bet money that any good pilot could glide six miles at an elevation of 3,000 feet in this aircraft. Switching perspectives, we're looking at the crash site now from the official nationwide quilt marine charts as produced by the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration. So the way these charts work is the numbers you see in the ocean are the depth of the ocean. So the depth of the ocean in the location of this crash is 47 feet deep. So it's about 100 feet less deep than the NTSB preliminary report shows. This is a depth that an experienced scuba diver could dive to without needing any special equipment. Recovering an aircraft at 47 feet depth in the Pacific Ocean, six miles offshore, wouldn't be cheap, but it wouldn't be impossible. Unfortunately, this airplane's been at the bottom of the ocean for almost three years now, so even if it was recovered, a lot of the evidence that could be used to further the investigation has probably been destroyed. Let's go ahead and look at this crash in Google Earth where we can better examine the question of whether or not it would have been possible for David to glide this airplane from an altitude of 3,000 feet to a flat landing area six miles away. Now let's just assume for easy numbers that the plane has a glide ratio of 10 to 1, meaning if he's got one mile of altitude, he can glide 10 miles. In this case, engine failure occurred at about 3,000 feet altitude, and he would need to glide just about six miles to make it to a nice flat agricultural field where he could gently put that airplane down just like he did on the ocean. So unlike the Trevor Jacob crash where there was ample landing area from an elevation of 9,000 feet, we're 6,000 feet lower and there's not quite as many landing options that are within the glide path. However, there are some and we can see those pretty clearly in Google Earth. So looking at Tinnitus Creek directly to the crash site, we're about five miles, a little over five miles. So when I ask myself, is this pilot good enough to glide an airplane six miles, 3,000 feet elevation? I think the answer is yes. He's a very talented skier. First guy to do a double front flip on skis, according to his YouTube channel. And this airplane crash video he made got 9 million views, which is well over anything else he ever created. 
Okay, switching gears one more time to the type of person David is from a storytelling media personality. Let's take a look at this Judge Mattis clip from his high school years. Had, you know, three witnesses in my car who saw the whole thing, and um, everyone had the same story, and it all came together, and the truth came out. I think he just talked to his friends about it and basically was like, yeah, we'll say this, say this, say this. And I think they just said it. So let's conclude this episode. We've learned quite a bit about David Lesh and his history of publicity stunts. We've looked into his airplane crash, and I think the NTSB will eventually take his air, his pilot's license when they do finish their investigation. And when we compare these two crashes and these two people we know they both have a history of publicity stunts they both crashed airplanes in locations where they could have reasonably landed their airplanes like a glider in a flat open area they both have uh, criminal backgrounds and have both been arrested they both have a history of train hopping I didn't cover that in this episode but there's a lot of material for one episode and they're both under investigation by the NTSB. In any case, that's all I have for you today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you around.